for our time then this evening. Let us return to that chapter we read earlier, 2 Samuel chapter 6. We want to look at the whole chapter. I'm not going to isolate one verse. Instead, the chapter will be our text. The title for our meditation this evening is The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. This is what this chapter is about. It's about the Ark of the Covenant and of David's desire to have the Ark at the very center of his kingdom. We may well ask ourselves if we are ignorant of the Ark, what's so special about the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony as it's called on another occasion? The Ark was three and three quarters by two and a quarter by two and a quarter feet and it was made of Shittim wood. It was gold plated, and the ark contained the stones with the Ten Commandments inscribed on them by the finger of God. Also within that ark, Aaron's rod, the rod that had budded, according to what we find in Numbers chapter 17, that rod was there as a memorial where God indeed vindicated Aaron as opposed to those who opposed him. And there was a pot of manna also installed in the ark to remind the people that God had fed them during the time of their wilderness wanderings. But what was so significant about the ark was that it symbolized the presence of God. This is what it symbolized. It symbolized that God was among them. And David was so keen to have this visible presence or visible token of the presence of the living God in his kingdom that he decided that he would go and take the ark from where it had been for 20 years. It had been in a place called Kirjath Jerim, or as our chapter tells us, Baal Judah, for 20 years. And it was in the home of Abinadab. And what is particularly noticeable is that during the reign of Saul, all the time that Saul reigned, he never called upon the ark. He never sought it. He thought nothing of it. To him, it was irrelevant. But to David, who, as we noticed in the last time that we looked at Second Samuel chapter 5, David came to that conclusion rightly, that God had blessed the kingdom, and that David was established, and that David was the ruler of the kingdom because he was God's man to rule God's people for that time. And he recognized that God's hand was upon him for good. The last time that we looked at Second Samuel chapter 15, we noticed there that David had fought against the long-time enemies of Israel, and he had defeated them on two occasions. And everything, to some extent, was rosy in the kingdom of David. But there was one thing missing. And of course, David had a heart for the living God. And he wanted the ark to be in the very center of Jerusalem, to be in the very center of his people, to be in the very center of his kingdom. And this was a marked change from Saul, who despised it and thought nothing of it. Well, David's kingdom was now somewhat settled and peaceful. He had achieved a remarkable event. He had, by waiting upon God, by being patient and 
by conducting himself in a good manner, he had managed to unite the divided Israel so that he was now king over all. And a time of peace and prosperity was there. But David, a man after God's own heart, wanted the ark of the covenant to be with him. And it's very interesting, friends, in this introduction to notice that when David's kingdom was settled, when he was content, when he had achieved things, when he knew the blessing of the Lord was upon him and upon his people and upon his kingdom, he wanted to address the matter of the worship of God. This was important to David. His kingdom was fine, but now he had this opportunity to turn his attention to the public worship of God and to put the ark in the place where it should be, in the very heart of God's kingdom. As I said, I have three things that I wish to draw from this chapter for you this evening for your edification. The first thing I want us to notice is the Lord's presence. The Lord's presence. We find this in verses 1 and 2. David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubims. This indeed was a good idea. We might say that David's heart was right. We might say the people's heart was right. They had a good intention. It was notable. It was worthy. It was worthy of applause that they wanted to address this issue. And all the people gathered and there was great harmony and unity among the people. Because, as I said in the introduction, the ark symbolized the presence of the living God. And God had been good to them in the previous chapter and now they wanted to crown it by having the presence, the visible token of the presence of God in the very midst of the people. And the ark, friends, does teach us and does remind us of God's presence. On a later occasion, when David is addressing the subject of building a temple for the Lord, something that he wanted to do that was in his heart, but he was not allowed to. Instead, we know that Solomon, his son, built the temple But David, as he was addressing this subject, said in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 2, Then David, the king, stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine, I had in mine heart to build an house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of of our God, and had made ready for the building. And what we want to note here is what he says about the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. What do rulers sit upon? They sit upon thrones, and they put their feet upon the footstool. And this is reminding us that the ark indeed was a symbol of the presence of the living God. He was going to be the ruler in Israel. He was going to sit upon his throne and his footstool was going to be upon the ark, symbolizing that he was ultimately the ruler, that David was ruling because God wanted him to rule. And David was happy with this. David was one who was happy to be a ruler under God. That's the kind of king that God wanted. One who will rule in the fear of the living God. And the very fact that the 
the ark was a symbol of the presence of this great and this glorious ruler. But the ark is also something that reminds us of reconciliation. Reconciliation because on the day of atonement, the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sin offering on the lid of the ark and in the front of the ark. And there again, as it symbolized the presence of God, it also symbolized the fact that God was a God who wants to be reconciled. And with God there is reconciliation. There is forgiveness of sins. There is a way back to God. We have all sinned and fall short of His glory. And in of ourselves there is no way to be reconciled to God. But through the way that He has provided and of course the ark was a, was a reminder that there is reconciliation. And on that great day of atonement, when the high priest went in with blood, there the people were reconciled to God. But if the ark speaks to us of the presence of God and of reconciliation, it also reveals to us that the ark is a symbol of God's revelation. As we said in the introduction, in the ark was the Ten Commandments. There was the testimony. There was the covenant that the people entered into. The law of God was there. It was reminding them that God was going to rule over them by his law. And the ark was, was the place where the Lord would meet with Moses when he wanted to find out other things when the Lord wanted to communicate with Moses additional instruction for Israel, it was around the ark. There God revealed his mind, his will to the people of God. The ark was the place of the Lord's directing word. And by desiring to have this ark and the visible presence of God David was saying, he was opening up his hands wide and saying that God is going to be at the very center of his kingdom. Well, for New Testament Christians, the ark speaks to us of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through him, he is our great prophet and priest and king. The ark points to the Lord Jesus Christ and his glorious and wonderful ministry. He's the one who has suffered and died. He's the one who offered up himself. When the, the ark spoke of reconciliation, we have reconciliation in Christ. And when the ark speaks about God ruling by his word and by his law, we are in Christ. We are ruled by Christ. He is our King. This is what it teaches us. That the Lord Jesus Christ is our great ark. He is the one who symbolizes the presence of the living God. David wanted that in his experience. He wanted that for his kingdom. For too long... For too long the ark had been in some backwater. But now it was going to be right in the center of his kingdom. And for Christians, friends, it must be Christ. Christ must be in the center of our lives. He must be upon the throne of our hearts. Christ indeed is that glorious presence of the living God. The second thing I want us to notice from these verses is the Lord's holiness. The Lord's holiness. We're not going to reread read them, but this will be found in verses 3 to 11. Here we find in this section that the crowd begin to take the ark back. They go to the house of Abinadab. They put the ark on a cart. 
and Ohio and Azza, the two sons of Abinadab, they accompany it. And there's great music and dancing and singing. There's great joy. There's wonderful enthusiasm. This is wonderful. This is great. Things are really happening now. The ark which has been out of our presence is now going to be at the very center of the national life again. Things are looking up. And there was tremendous amount of enthusiasm and joy. They were all dancing and happy. It was a wonderful occasion until until God revealed his holiness. Everything was going well until verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord and all manner of instruments made of firewood, even on harps and on psalteries and on trimbles and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Azza put forth his hand to the ark of God and took it and took hold of it for the oxen shook it and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Azza and God smote him there for his error and there he died by the ark of God everything went quiet The oxen stumbled. The ark was going to fall. Azza, whose heart was right, he didn't want anything to happen to the ark. He didn't want it to be damaged in any way. He put forth his hand to stabilize it, that it might remain upon the ark. But God revealed his holiness. God took his life because of that act. And here God was demonstrating that he is not a God to be tampered with. He's not a God to be trifled with. You see, the whole procedure was wrong. It was flawed right from the very beginning. The Kohathites should have moved the ark. The law of God would tell them very clearly. If they just consulted with the law of God, it would have told them that the Levites, the Kohathites, should have moved the ark. They should not on any occasion touch it, but instead they should have carried it using gold-plated poles upon their shoulders. They were not allowed to look at it. The rules were quite clear and quite simple. No touch, no look, no card. And when it was carried, it had to be carried, covered with badger skins and a blue cloth. That's the way God had laid it down. That's the part of the worship of God. And as we know, friends, God is zealous for his worship. We cannot just stand up and worship God any way we like. We cannot do what we want with the worship of God. It has to be conformed to the word of God. And on this occasion, God made an example of Azza. As he's done on other occasions, we might say this was, in some sense, a new beginning for Israel. The king was established. God's king was established. Israel was united. They were, they were embarking on a new era. Saul was gone. It was now David's kingship. And God was laying down this fundamental law. That he's a holy God and he must be worshipped according to the way that he has prescribed. We could think of other occasions when he has done exactly the same thing. You could think of Nadab and Abihu. The tabernacle had just been erected. Moses had laid down the requirements of how they should worship and what the priests should do. They were clothed in all their finery. They began to minister before the Lord and they offered strange fire 
And we are told in Leviticus what happened. They were burnt to death. There God was making an example. A new era had begun in Israel. And these priests did not follow the pattern that had been prescribed. And they paid the ultimate price. We could think of Achan. We could think of the time when they were about to enter into the promised land. And they had entered in and they were fighting their enemies. And Achan was told, the people were told, they were not to take from the booty. Achan took some of the booty, hid it in his house, under his tent. And when it was found out, he and his family were destroyed. God again revealing he's a holy God. You can go to the New Testament era. There a new beginning. The church was growing. It was flourishing. Ananias and Sapphira, what did they do? They sold land. And they said they got a certain amount for it, which wasn't accurate, wasn't correct. They lied to the church, both of them on separate occasions. What happened to them? They dropped down dead. God making an example. This is what he looks for from his people. He looks for obedience. He's a holy God. That's what he's telling David and the people. That's what he's telling us. Now of course we know that many people might lie to the church today and they don't drop dead. No, of course not. God has already made an example. But God does not change. He is a holy God. And he's not to be trifled with. David did not do what God would have him to do. If you can remember when we looked at 2 Samuel chapter 5 last time, I think I did say to you that it was clear that David sought the Lord. We are particularly told that the two times that he went to battle with the Philistines, he sought the Lord first. He prayed, and on the first occasion the Lord told him, go up and attack. On the second occasion the Lord told him, don't go up and attack, instead circle around them. But the point is, on each occasion David sought the Lord and would do nothing until he sought the Lord. We don't find him seeking the Lord on this occasion. Yes, he gathered the people, he gathered the leaders, he gathered the people of preeminence. The people were all for him. But there's no word that he called upon the living God. Also, it's important to note, and I'm grateful for a commentator here, when they put the ark of, a, of the covenant and a cart. They were following the practice of the pagans. If you can remember when we looked at this earlier in 1 Samuel, when the Philistines who had captured the ark, and when they had suffered because they had captured the ark, they basically wanted rid of it. And when they got rid of it, they put the ark on a new cart. And it went off in the right direction. And it does seem as if David and the Israelites followed the practice of the pagans instead of listening to the Lord their God. Now on that occasion, the Lord was willing to accept what the pagans done because they didn't know any better. But God's people, David... And the people should have known better that the ark is not to go on a cart. Instead, it is to be carried upon the shoulders of the Levites.
Brethren, let us not be following the pagans. Let us not be following the, the world. If we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, He is our Lord. He is our King. We follow Him. We're not going to have the practices of the pagans. We're not going to follow the, the world. We're going to follow the Lord Jesus, the one who has saved us, the one who has redeemed us, the one who has taken us unto himself, the one who has promised us eternal life with him, the one who has forgiven our sins, and the one who has done all that is necessary to save us. Will we follow the world? Will we follow the pagans? Will we do what they do? Will we do what they tell us over above what Jesus Christ tells us? Ask yourself. Our God is uncompromising, friends. Our God doesn't care about political correctness. In verse 8 it tells us there the Lord had made a breach upon Azar. David was displeased. He didn't like this. The Lord had made a breach upon Azar. He had broken out. He had done that. An outbreak. But again if you can remember chapter 5 and the battle with the Philistines. There God made a breach upon them. There God broke out upon the Philistines. Let me read that verse to you. Second Samuel chapter 5 verse 20. And David came to baal Perizim, And David smote them there and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place baal Perazim. Now why am I quoting that verse and contrasting it with verse 8 of 2 Samuel chapter 6? Well friends, I'm quoting it because David was happy when God broke out against his enemies. But David was not happy when God broke out against his friends. And the point that we are meant to derive from it is God is no respecter of persons. We are not to tamper with the living God. The message is clear. We are not to trifle with a holy God. The Philistines, they tampered with God and he broke out upon them. Asa did not obey the word of God. And God in his holiness was making an example of him. God is no respecter of persons. The church, we need to learn this. We need to be reminded we must serve the Lord with fear, with reverence, Realizing our God is a consuming fire. What else do we want to draw from this chapter? Well, thirdly and finally, we have the Lord's joy. We have the Lord's joy. <clears throat> and this will be found really in verses 12 to the end. Verse 11 tells us the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And this message ultimately filtered through to David. Verse 12, it was told King David saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom. So David was encouraged. You see, what happened to Azza was a reminder to them 
of the holiness of God. But it was not God's last word. It was not all over. It was not curtains for them. God showed that he could be reconciled to them and that in some way the ark could come into uh, David's kingdom, the center of David's kingdom, if they would only do it the right way. And the very fact that Obed-Edom was blessed and his household was to encourage them to come before the Lord in the way that he had appointed and that he would receive them. Because God ultimately, he wanted to bless his people with the ark and with his visible token of his presence there. He was telling them it was the Lord's intention to bless the people through the ark, not to destroy them. But they had to learn this lesson. And of course it was brought into Jerusalem. And as the previous occasion, there was plenty of joy. There was enthusiasm. There was dancing. There was music. There was instruments. This was a joyful experience. This was a joyful time. They had learnt their lesson. Things were put in order. So David went, verse 12, So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they had bare the ark of the Lord and had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And God accepted their sacrifices. Wonderful, joyful experience. This is really, in some sense, should be the experience of the Christian. There should be a wonderful joy and happiness and peace when we serve the living God. Yes, we know God is holy. Yes, we know He burns with holiness. This is true. But when we serve Him rightly, when we acknowledge our sin, when we come before Him the way that He wants us to come before Him, we are to do it with joy in our hearts. We are to be happy people above all people. Who should be happy but those who are going to heaven? Who should be happy but those who have their sins forgiven? Who should be happy but those who have been reconciled to God? Who should be happy but those who have a wonderful hope? I'm not talking about worldly lightness. Of course not. I'm not talking that we should be comedians. Of course not. But there is such a thing as a holy joy. Evidently, that holy joy did not extend to David's household. We know that David was so taken up with what was going on that he gave the people wine and, and some flesh to eat. And then when he returned to his own house, he had to meet his wife who did not approve of his dancing. And she scolded him. In verse 20 we're told, And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. She couldn't wait till he got in the house and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. Poor David. It must have taken the shine off his day to get this rebuke from his wife. But it's interesting to note, if you look at the narrative, Michael, Saul's daughter, is mentioned three times in this chapter. And she's never mentioned as David's wife. It's always as Saul's daughter. 
in verse 16, verse 20, and verse 23. She is mentioned three times, but never as David's wife. Instead, it's Saul's daughter. This is surely significant. And surely this is telling us here that she was of the old regime. She was Saul's family. And she didn't share in the enthusiasm for the ark. She didn't know this joy. She didn't know this wonderful uh, experience that now the ark where it had been hiding in some unknown place almost was now in the very center of David's kingdom. She didn't share this joy. She didn't share in this enthusiasm. There was nothing in her heart. She was of the old regime. She belonged to Saul's family. And what do we find? No child until the day of her death. What does that mean? Well, it obviously means she had no children, but one commentator maintained that David did not have natural relationship or natural relations with her from that time on. She didn't share in the Lord's joy. Friends, let us be joyful. Let us be joyful Christians. Let us joy in the Lord. Is it not in Nehemiah? The joy of the Lord is our strength. How can we face the things of today, the trials, the temptations, the difficulties, the hard providences that will come upon us, it is with joy. Surely we should have joy. Surely our worship should be joyful. Let me quote. Let me close with a quote from Blakey, the commentator. There are doubtless times to be calm. And times to be enthusiastic. But can it be right to give all our coldness to Christ and all our enthusiasm to the world? You have to answer that question yourself. But if we're truly in Christ, if a great hard work has begun in us, in you, it should bring some joy to you. Your Christian life, yes, you'll have difficulties. Yes, you'll have heartaches. You will not avoid them. But underneath all of that, there should be this joy in the Lord Jesus Christ and in what you have in him, how rich you are in Christ. Surely this is what made David dance. Michael, what did she say? Who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants. How did David answer? It was before the Lord which chose me. I wasn't dancing before people. I wasn't looking at people. I wasn't doing it for their benefit. I was before the Lord. And I'm happy to be dancing before the Lord. And if people laugh at me, so what? I'm right with God. God is blessing my kingdom. And now we have the ark symbolizing the holy, glorious presence of God among us. Will I not dance? Will I not joy in that? Friends, we have more than what David has. 
We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Will we not joy? Will we not have a spring in our step? We should. And of course, in one real sense, we will. We're all different. Some are more exuberant than others. Some are more outgoing than others. And very often those who seem to be the most happiest outwardly are not. Very often those who are quieter, more reserved, they might well have far more of this joy that David had. May this be our experience. Amen. And may the Lord bless his word to us. Let us pray together.